Few available images of the terrorists point to a well-armed and perhaps highly confident group. Well, officials have pointed fingers at the Somalia terrorist outfit Al-Shabaab, but is Al-Shabaab getting help from Kenyans or simply taking advantage of a corrupt system? KTN's John Alanamu takes a closer look at the threat that remains real even after the end of the Westgate siege. From the Westgate shopping mall on Saturday, both of these images showing two separate pairs of men matching witness descriptions of the attackers. Four men, all tall and slender. These two wearing black headscarves, their faces exposed as they patrol the third floor of the Westgate shopping mall. This man wearing what appears to be a bulletproof vest. On their backs, bullet and magazine bags that look heavy laden likely bulging with magazines to reload the AK-47 and G3 rifles that they used to kill. Bags that it is believed also bulged with hand grenades that eyewitnesses report were lobbed at scampering shoppers once the onslaught began. But that was the beginning of the onslaught. From shortly after 2 p.m. on Saturday, the terrorists would be engaged in a fierce gunfight, first by the police, then by the GSU's REC company, and finally by various units of the Kenya Defense Forces 20 para unit, special forces and rangers. The gunfire may have been sporadic, but the questions remain about how 10 to 15 terrorists could have sustained a gunfight for well into the 72 hours of the siege. The New York Times is already reporting allegations from U.S. security officials that the terrorists had schematics of the Westgate Mall and most likely had moved munitions into the building before the attack. But the government has dismissed that claim for now, saying that it's waiting until all the facts are in. We sought answers from one of the shareholders of Sony Holdings Limited, Israeli national Alex Trachtenberg, quoted as one of the owners of the Westgate shopping mall. Hello? Mr. Trachtenberg? Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Allen Namu. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a reporter. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to you about uh, Westgate. No, I cannot speak. I'm very busy in this uh, few, uh, uh, one week or two weeks, so you can call me after two weeks, please. Um, if, okay. if I can just ask you just one question before you... Still, though, there are narratives that explain, if only in part, why this attack could have happened. A lot of them start and end with corruption. Border security may have been beefed up after the attack, but it is corruption within the police and immigration that have, in the past, and likely with this attack, made it difficult to foil the entry of persons that wished to do harm to the country before. Prior to his death in Mogadishu, Mohammed Fazul would periodically slip in and out of the country, escaping dragnets four times, once even after he had been arrested. Another is this. In 2011, posing as an arms dealer, I was able to negotiate to purchase this. A G3 rifle from arms dealers who I had met that very day in Isiolo. Isiolo is among a number of frontier towns which are well-known arms smuggling points. The routes through which arms are smuggled are well-known. There are many more questions being raised about the state of security in the country, including those around claims that the government had received intelligence briefings about plans to attack a number of shopping malls in Nairobi, one of them being Westgate. Criticism of the National Intelligence Services has been swift. Where did the stretcher guys? But in the attack that shocked the world, Kenya's entire security superstructure will come under sharp focus in order to avoid yet more threats from coming to fruition. The siege may be over, but those who would do harm to the country are still out there. John Alanamu, KTN.